Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. And we are back with another Norsville review. I'm Chris. And I am Chad. And for today's episode, we are reviewing 1998's Neo Noir Out of Sight. Steven Soderbergh directed the film, which starred George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez, John Shadell, and Ving Rhames. Rhames? Rhames. Ving Rhames. Ving Rhames, yeah. I called it Rhames, but okay. okay. Ving Rhames. Um, this film. It's now 20 years old, which uh, <laughs> is surprising to me because I feel like it just came out yesterday, or yeah. I guess I'm just getting old. But uh, it's it's basically just about a bank robber named Jack Foley who escapes from prison only to meet U.S. Marshal Karen Sisko uh, while he and his ex-con partner Buddy prepare one final heist to steal $5 million in diamonds. Karen tracks them down to Detroit. And the two end up falling in love. Do they get the diamonds? Does he get the girl? Will the sun shine brightly in Noirsville? We just don't know. Well, we'll find out because it's actually in color and not in black and white. Oh, that's true. That's part of the neo-noir movement. (laughs) It's in color more often these days than not, unless it's a Sin City type film. Oh, yes, yes. But yeah, this film is 20 years old. Uh, Chad, do you, did you know how uh, this did in the theater at all? Yeah, as you said, it was released in 1998 on June 26th. Opened up in 2,106 uh, theaters. Only stayed in the theaters for three weeks, but made a worldwide gross of 70, just under $78 million off of a $48 million budget. So Out of Sight was the 57th ranked movie in 1998. That same year, Saving Private Ryan, Armageddon, and Chris's favorite uh, Ben Stiller film, There's Something About Mary, came out. It opened up against Chris's favorite Eddie Murphy film, Dr. Doolittle, on that weekend. Never saw Um, it. (laughs) Oh, damn. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I like bad Eddie Murphy movies, but that was not one I've seen. (laughs) And uh, Dr. Doolittle was number six for the entire year. Uh, That same weekend, uh, Mulan and the original X-Files movie were uh, Out of Sight's main competition. Uh, Out of Sight opened up in fourth place behind Doolittle, Mulan, and X-Files. Let's see, what else? It was nominated for two Oscars. Um, Scott Frank uh, was nominated for the Adapted Screenplay category. And Ann Coates um, was nominated for editing in this film. Uh, The National Society of Film Critics voted it the best film of 1998. Steven Soderbergh was, he won, excuse me, the National Society voted it the best film in 98. Soderbergh won the award for best director. And Scott Frank won the award for best screenplay. And then, let's see here. AFI nominated the film uh, 100 Years, 100 Thrills. It was also nominated uh, as a, one of the top 10 gangster films. Entertainment Weekly called Out of Sight the sexiest film ever. That's and, a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it won the award shortly after the movie was released. So it may have just been one of those things. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, let's see, the Internet Movie Database Voters gives the film a 7 out of 10. 
Metascore gives the film an 85 out of 100. And Rotten Tomatoes gives it 93% critics and 74% audience. And that's the stats for Out of Sight. Did you see this film in the theater? I mean, three weeks wasn't very long. No, I did not. I grabbed it on um, VHS as soon as it hit my vi- local video store. I did not see in the theater. Um, heard a lot of buzz behind it because of uh, Clooney's rising popularity because of ER. And he did one other movie. I can't remember what it was with um, Michelle Pfeiffer. But this was supposed to be the groundbreaking film for him or the launching pad film for him based on everything I read in Entertainment Weekly and some other films, film magazines. I didn't know about it. I The first time I saw it, I went over to my parents for dinner and they had it on and I had missed like maybe 20 minutes of it. But I ended up watching the whole remaining hour and 40 minutes of it and I enjoyed it uh, that first time and then I... I'd say about a couple of weeks later, I rented it and watched it uh, from beginning to end. But it, it's a very interesting story. It's pretty gripping from from beginning to end, and it's very funny too. Yeah, and that's one of the things. It I for a two hour movie, uh, to me, it never ever lags. Mm-hmm. And I've probably seen this a dozen times at least. But I, it, from the get go, even the first half an hour of the movie, it's very fast paced. You're getting a lot of information. And it just keeps moving right along and you don't really lag. You don't have a slowdown. So like you said, I mean, you, it caught your attention and you ran with it and you wanted to see the rest of it. So that's pretty cool. And it does have all the elements of a noir that I, that I enjoy Uh, a good crime story. Mm -hmm. Uh, The, uh, the theme of one last heist before we retire, things not going according to plan, you Mm -hmm. know, and it has all the elements of a, a great noir. And, um, you know, in some ways, there's not a whole lot to the story. It's basically the escape uh, from the prison. Then it's moving on to Detroit. But there is a, an, um, a lot of stuff that goes on in this film with the use of a few flashbacks and some layering of the story. It's- yeah, and you mentioned that flashbacks. I think that's what really makes this movie is the fact it's not – Tarantino-esque where you have different timelines at different points in the film, but you get to know who Jack Foley is through the various flashbacks of he at prison A versus prison B and where he met these guys, where they got the idea for the stealing um, the diamonds from uh, Ripley. Um, And it's very well done because you're not at the same settings either. You got the two different prisons, which, look totally different. So you can believe that um, the storyline took place in different areas. And like I say, it just gave it that layer of interest. And it's cool from that sense. Like I said, Jack was one of those guys that in in one scene, he's sort of looking around seeing the older um, prisoners and how they were all like 60, 70, 80 years old with no teeth. And He didn't want to die in prison looking like these guys. And that sort of gave it some credibility as to why he wanted to break out and try to move on with his life. Yeah. And and also a a big element of, of noirs is a lot of them will start off with all of the events having ended and it's just the main character Mm. retelling the events. And it kind of does that where it starts, um, I don't know, maybe about a third of the way, you know, into the film where he he's just leaving the bank building and then goes and rob or he's he's leaving the office building and then he goes and robs the bank mm-hmm. so in the, in terms of the timeline maybe that's about a third of the way in and then it's a lot of retelling so i did also enjoy that approach to the noir style where it wasn't necessarily um a linear retelling of the events and how it bounced back and forth yeah i agree completely because then you sort of get the sense okay is is Jack one of those guys who's actually a bank robber who's just doing foolish stuff and he wants to be a lifelong criminal? But then you sort of find out through his, the various flashbacks that he meets Ripley, Rip, helps out Ripley in prison, and then Ripley basically tells him, hey, I have something for you outside of here that, should you ever need it. And flash to the future, the past, whatever it was, that he goes to get the job and Ripley basically says, 
you are nothing. You don't have any real life skills. I'm giving you a security guard job. And that's when he goes in, gets a security guard job. Jack's upset and moves forward because he thinks it's supposed to be something more credible. But Ripley's giving him a chance to have a legit life. And Jack just doesn't want to take it. He wants to be who he typically has been. But as you said, you get those pieces in different time frames and you have to then go back and sort of piece it all together to figure out why they are who they are. And Ripley's not necessarily a good guy, not necessarily a bad guy. Jack's not necessarily a good guy, but he's not exactly evil either uh, compared to some of the other characters like, say, a Snoop. And that's the fun part of this film is, like you say, you sort of jump around and you get to learn about this ensemble in a nice manner that way. No, I agree. And, you know, in some ways, um, Ripley was was right about Jack, though. I mean, he didn't, oh, I agree. he didn't have skills other than robbing banks. I mean, in a business world, in a business environment, he did not have – he might have what it takes to succeed in a prison world, but he does not have it in the corporate world. And so I don't think Ripley was – even though he's not necessarily the, the greatest of people, of humans in general, I don't think he was really wrong about his assessment of Jack. Yeah, because I don't know what Jack even thought he was going to, what kind of job he was actually going to get once he went to visit Ripley. I mean, what was he supposed to do? Be <laughs> how not to rob my banks type of consultant? Uh, that's I did get that part of it. Mm-hmm. What was he supposed to be getting? Uh, security would have been the only thing the guy really could uh, take and be good at, so... I am a little puzzled as to how Ripley could just go back to his old business, though, because he was in jail for yeah. embezzlement. So that was a little puzzling to me. But, this is true. Uh, but I let that slide. <laughs> yeah, that's that. He was funny, and Al, Albert Brooks did a. You want to talk about a slimy businessman? He plays one very, very well in this film. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe a little too well. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but his performance was was excellent in it. I do like. George Clooney, he, he, he does play a good everyday man. Everyday men don't have the kind of looks he has, of course, but um, sure. he plays a very good everyday man character. Yeah, and I, I in my notes, I wrote down, man, this is what a great five-star performance for George. He's very believable. You know, he has a gives you a broad range of emotions in this film. He, you can tell he's street smart. You can tell he's a tough guy. You can tell he's a smart aleck. Um, he's vulnerable because he's not always spot on with his decision making. Uh, he's got a romantic heart. Um, and he sort of has the same characteristics as his acting heroes, a Humphrey Bogart or a James Cagney or a Steve McQueen. They all sort of shared these same type of traits and Clooney sort of brought them all together in this movie. He's up there with, um, uh, Robert De Niro's uh, portrayal of Neil McCauley in the movie Heat in terms of that era's bad guys who I think are just absolutely cool because they're bad guys, but yet they're intelligent bad guys and they're doing the crime to make a living. And they're not just like I think uh, some, uh, De Niro said in Heat, he's not walking around with a born to lose tattoo on his forehead. They're trying to be smart about it, but yet the risk is going to jail. So they accept it and they move on. And it's just really cool to see these type of characters. Mm -hmm. And what did you think of um, Jennifer Lopez? You know, at this time in her career, I still thought of her as one of the dancers in, (laughs) um, in, in living color. So, you know, I didn't really think of her as an actress, even at this point, but I thought she did a a nice job, nothing outstanding, but I thought she did a very nice job. Yeah, I'm still amazed by how well she did in this film. Um, I was amazed. I was actually astonished by how well she was as an actress back in when I first saw this movie. And it, it, her performance still holds up to this day. She, again, gives a broad range. Uh, she's very believable as a young, um, gung-ho sort of FBI agent who is trying to please her dad and try to make her way in the the boys world, if you will. Um, and she's very believable. She doesn't give too much. She doesn't try to be too cutesy. Um, she's beautiful, but yet she's not someone like 
I don't know, uh, say a Sandra Bullock who was up for this role, Mm -hmm. who I think would have been too attractive for this role and probably would have thrown too much comedy into it. I think uh, J-Lo did a great job with this, and she didn't seem to play second fiddle to anybody in this film, in my point of view. No, I think she's a very credible uh, daughter of a U.S. Marshal. You know, I I think that you you could imagine her being raised in in a no-nonsense household. So... I think that she was very believable in this role. I think she was well cast. Yeah. And you couldn't have asked for a better person to play the father than Dennis Farina, who was a former Chicago police officer who knows how to act in that role and has done it many, many times. And like, uh, what was the old 80s show, a crime story. And then I think he went on to do some other TV shows where he played a cop and he was in get shorty Mm -hmm. as well. So he's familiar with this type of material. So uh, Dennis Farina, every time I see him, I just get a smile on my face because he's a legend in this type of genre for me. Now, this uh, film is based on a uh, Elmore Leonard novel, the the second one in as many years, because um, 1997, Quentin Tarantino made Jackie Brown based on his novel as well. So, you know, back to back years. Elmore Leonard has these uh, movies come out based on his books. Uh, Michael Keaton even makes a cameo as Ray Nicolette, who is in Jackie Brown. Yeah. Um, in, in this film, it, you know, it's nice to see him as in a cameo, but he's really not necessary to this story. Uh, maybe a little bit of, um, of Karen's uh, motivations in the background, but other than that, you could take him out and he, he wouldn't uh, have been missed. But uh, what do you think of Elmore Leonard's uh, style? Even though these were made, you know, you know, other writers made the screenplays. But uh, what do you think of Elmore Leonard in general? Have you read any of his books, by the way? Yeah, I have. I have read um, Rum Punch, which uh, became Jackie Brown. And I've listened to Out of Sight. And I've listened to Get Shorty. And I just love his style. Everything from 310 to Yuma when he was back doing Westerns to, uh, like I said, Rum Punch, which turned into Jackie Brown. And I agree with you. That just little crossover between Jackie Brown and Out of Sight with having Ray Nicolette and both of them played by Michael Mm -hmm. Keaton is a nice little touch because Elmore Leonard has these broad worlds of uh, very quirky characters. And that's one of the things that I think added to flavor to this cinematic universe. Um, I was always a big fan of the TV show justified because of his works. I think his type of style is awesome as a writer and as a viewer and a reader, because he has a broad universe with a lot of quirky characters who aren't necessarily uh, morally, <laughs> correct if you will Mm -hmm. they do questionable things they for whether it be for good or for bad or their own selfish purposes whatever it is but it then makes you as you're watching it question your own what would you do in this situation um do you enjoy it um is it a good or i should say do you enjoy it is it a good move to make what would you have done differently so it's not a straightforward uh cliche character that he's throwing on the screen or in his books or any type of TV show or something like that. His characters are awesome for that reason. And I think that you mentioned Jackie Brown. I think one of the things that got the Elmore Leonard stuff rolling was actually the movie get shorty mm-hmm. because they took that. And I think 95 yeah, and that was had 95. a very, yeah, had a very successful run in the theaters with that. And I, if I remember correctly, Danny DeVito loved his experience with get shorty so much that he went and bought the rights to out of sight and then eventually turned it over to the studios to be produced. And so if I remember right, he's one of the main producers on out of sight. Yeah. He's a producer on the, on the film for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. If I thought it was correct, but yeah, it, I love anything Elmore Leonard. I'll go back and find, like I said, uh, Joe kid is a, Oh, Donkey barking here. Sorry about that. The dog approves of <laughs> his writing style. <laughs> but no, he'll go. I'll go back and watch like Joe Kidd with Clint Eastwood. Um, I said both versions of 310 to Yuma. Those are some Western type stuff that he did. And I find all of his work very, very enjoyable. 
Now, I didn't really have much of an opinion, um, you know, back in the day of Don Shadell, but I thought mm-hmm. he did an excellent job in in this film. Uh, he, in many ways, Good. I think he carries the second half of this film more so than George Clooney. Yeah, Don's, I think he's an extraordinary actor, and I think he's one of those that's been in this little troop with uh, Soderbergh over the years, um, along with Clooney when they made all the Ocean's 11, 12, 13 movies. Um, and he did traffic as well for Soderbergh. I think he's just awesome. I, that's my take on him. Um, he fit very, very well into this role as a all around antagonist. He's charming, but yet you can tell he's got toughness and comedic timing, but he's evil. He brings out the evil in this character, even though he is charming and all that stuff. He brings out the perfect set for this uh, role as Snoopy. I mean, he treats people badly. He's all about himself for the most part. He talks down to everybody, but he always has that look on his face like, hey, I'm still cool about it all, and you're all doing it my way, so that's all that matters. And that's uh, he is very, very excellent in this movie. One of the things I want to bring up to you, Chris, is um, – one of the most memorable scenes, or I'll go, with, I'll bring up two memorable scenes. One, the first memorable scene that everybody talks about in this movie is the trunk scene right at the very first half an hour of the movie where essentially Jack forces Karen into the trunk and they have their first encounter. Mm-hmm. And you learn a lot about both of the characters in a very short amount of time with just this little very tight space area, um, intimate lighting, if you will. They're basically Mm -hmm. spooning. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, under a red light, you know, yeah. Red light symbolic for whatever you want to symbolize it, I guess, in a sexual nature. Exactly. But uh, you could just tell in that very, there's a, in the DVD, there's an extended cut of this, but I guess test audiences didn't like it. So they trimmed it up. But there's a very, very nice conversation between them where you can definitely tell they're soulmates. And it very much foreshadows uh, what would happen with the what would happen if we met in a bar as stranger scenario, which will happen later on in the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that forced intimacy in that trunk scene sets up the relationship nicely and you really get their chemistry right off the bat. And then this, then that leads then into later on in what I feel is one of the best shot scenes in cinema history. And I'm very prejudiced about it because I like this movie. But the whole scene of her sitting in the hotel bar, restaurant or bar, and the way it's lit, dark inside the restaurant, but you had the big window with the Detroit city lights in the background, the snow coming, the very light snow coming down. It just looks gorgeous. And she fits the bill of what you should look like in this role. And then having Clooney uh, walk up to her and ask her if she wants a drink. And they start playing their cat and mouse game as if they didn't know each other in the whole, the way that whole thing is shot is just gorgeous. And then they turn it into, they start interweaving their, how they moved into the hotel room and their little cat and mouse game until they eventually have sex with each other. And that whole, all the steps that led into all that is just one of the best things I've ever seen in cinema. Yeah, it's a great scene. I'll agree with that. I mean, there's the peacefulness of the, the outdoors and the snow, and then it's underlit with this, uh, this yellow light that's kind of like a burning desire coming from below. You know, there's a lot of uh, um, not so subliminal meaning to that, you know, that Mm -hmm. there's something burning down below. So I think that it is a very nice scene. Um, The two guys uh, hitting on her was, was kind of stupid. I thought, (laughs) I don't think it was necessary. No, but um, after, you know, once he shows up and you see his reflection in the, in the window, uh, I agree with you that that's a very nice scene. And then also, you know, the beginning that you mentioned in the trunk where they're, um, where he's just broken out of jail 
And then they start talking about movies, you know, under the, the red glow. So they definitely did use a lot of use of color in this film to convey mood. Yeah, yeah. they definitely did a great job at showing these two having chemistry. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, yes, you'll see it while they're interacting, but the filmmaking itself basically helped show you they have chemistry. So now it's been spotlighted. Sink your teeth into it and enjoy it. And then her immediate regrets is, is he just using me? <laughs> Such a girl. <laughs> but th- I mean, but that was very realistic and natural. And that's no, and it what it was. And his response to it was a natural response mm-hmm. to it. And that's, I, I guess it's one of the reasons why I very much enjoy this film. Yeah. I mean, once her, her mind um, took back over from her desire, you know, she's like, well, did he just use me? So, you know, it's <laughs> fitting for, especially because, uh, and I think her dad alluded to this is that she's someone who, who does cover up her feelings to be, have this tough exterior. Mm-hmm. So she did let her guard down. And immediately after she let her guard down, she thought, well, maybe he used her because of that. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a good uh, showing of her not totally giving up her beliefs, you know, just sort of she's conflicted about um, her head versus her heart sort of beliefs. Yeah, I understand. It's going to get you every time. <laughs> okay, after all said and done, on a scale of one to five, do you consider this a, this film a bad one or a high five? Oh, this is a high four and a half for me. I really, really love this movie. I definitely would put it in, if I had a top 100, uh, top 50 something in my list, uh, it would be there. I enjoy watching this. It's just one of those great movies to me. I think George was very motivated as an actor back then because he had spent a lot of years with some mediocre stuff. Um, but he took over this role, and Soderbergh was coming into his own, and uh, this was just a well-made film. I recommend it to everybody. I agree with that completely. I'll give this film, I'm going to say a four and a half out of five. It's an excellent film. It's, it's Like I said, I went to my parents' house one night and ended up watching it, uh, the, the whole thing. And I, I haven't done that to very many films when uh, I went over to my parents' house. So, uh, you know, it uh, it did grip me when I saw, you know, even without uh, any knowledge of what it was about, because I have not read Elmore Leonard's novels at all. Mm-hmm. I, I know about his other works, but uh, but I have not read them. I like just about everybody in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, their performances are very strong and it, it, this is definitely a great modern day noir film. Oh, I can't disagree at all. I mean, it, this is just perfect for that type of a genre. All right. Well, that's it for our review of out of sight. So please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If there's a film you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, your location, and film choice. As always, we would like to thank the good folks over at purpleplanet.com. They are the people who give us our theme music via a Creative Commons license. We encourage you to visit their site if you ever get a chance. Until next time at Noirsville, I'm Chris. I'm Chad. Thanks once again for listening, and remember... When crime and noir meet, things never go as planned. Universal Pictures Home Entertainment does not endorse this podcast, which is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Out of sight. All names and sounds of out of sight characters and any other out of sight related items are registered trademarks and are copyrights of Universal Pictures Home Entertainment or the respective trademark and our copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Norsville, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>